A grandma ate cookie dough every week for lunch. This is what happened to her bones. CC is a 78-year-old woman presenting to the emergency room with night sweats, hot flashes, and insomnia. She tells the admitting nurse that she had unintentionally lost at least 25 pounds over the last two months. CC was a grandma originally from South America. She came to the United States with her son in the 1980s. Every week, CC would bake cookies for her grandkids. This was their favorite part of the week. Grandma knew exactly the kinds of cookies that they loved to eat, and she never forgot to make extras for them to bring back home. While baking, CC would always eat some of the cookie dough. There was always more than enough for everyone, and she thought to take the opportunity to have some herself. About four months ago, she started having trouble sleeping. She was getting night sweats and hot flashes. Every day, she'd notice her weight decrease on the scale. She wasn't eating less, she wasn't exercising more, she wasn't sure how this was happening, but she didn't think too much of it. Skin deep, CC was relatively healthy for a 78 year old. She had type 2 diabetes, but she took her medicines every day for it. She had high blood pressure and a heart condition known as atrial fibrillation, where one part of the heart beats so quickly, it doesn't actually produce a good contraction, which allows blood to pool, which could form a clot and get lodged in her brain and cause a stroke, but this was well controlled with medicines too. And just having these three problems at 78 years old isn't bad, but unintentionally losing 25 pounds in two months is probably something very bad. The weight loss isn't associated with diabetes because, well, she's eating sugary cookie dough at least once a week, and that's not exactly something that's gonna help you lose weight. CC asked the admitting nurse if the hot flashes were some sort of low-key fever. She was aware of the risks of eating cookie dough because raw eggs have the bacteria salmonella. So she wanted to make sure that she wasn't getting some kind of infection. But without presenting with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or an actual fever, it doesn't seem like she has any kind of food poisoning. Because she's 78, she's well past menopause, meaning that her night sweats are probably not hormonal. Not much has changed in her lifestyle, so it's likely that the sudden weight loss, given her age, could be cancer. Analysis of CC's blood finds anemia, an meaning without, and emia meaning presence of blood. The size of her red blood cells are normal, but the problem is, is that she just doesn't have a lot of them floating around in her body. Two months earlier, CC had come in for her regular checkup. Blood was drawn then too, giving us a baseline measurement. She had this anemia back then, but it's much worse now. Nitrogen and a waste product called creatinine are present at a level three times higher now than compared to two months ago. The kidneys are supposed to be filtering these things out of the blood, but now they're not. Her kidneys are failing. A massive amount of protein in her urine, more than 40 times the upper limit of normal, is collected. Cookie dough has raw eggs. Eggs have a lot of protein, but this isn't the protein that's in CeCe's urine. Eggs don't cause kidney failure. Cookie dough can cause food poisoning, but food poisoning isn't kidney dysfunction. But diabetes causes kidney damage. Elevated blood sugar levels and increased inflammation contribute to kidney injury. But if we have a baseline measurement from two months ago, this rate of decline is just way too quick to count it as diabetic nephropathy, meaning that something else must be causing this problem, which brings us back to cancer. CT scans of her chest, abdomen, and pelvis reveal nothing. Her lymph nodes, which are typically the first sites to where cancer spreads, were clear. No primary tumor or metastatic disease to be found, so it doesn't look like she has a solid organ cancer. But how about bone marrow cancer? That would cause problems with her blood cells and she does have anemia, except Analysis of her blood proteins, again, reveals no cancer. But the results are borderline and nonspecific. Clearly, something is wrong. They show maybe an infection of some sort, which might point us back to the cookie dough that she eats for lunch every week. But time is up. She doesn't have a life-threatening emergency. Without a good reason to admit her into the hospital, Cece is discharged from the emergency room, and she's referred to the kidney clinic. They sample some kidney tissue from her to look at underneath a microscope. As the days go by, Cece's night sweats become more intense. She continues to bake the cookies for her grandkids because she doesn't want to stress them out. She doesn't want them to even think that anything is wrong. This health scare shakes her confidence, but she doesn't have cancer, so it's probably not that serious, she thought. In the kidney clinic, two weeks later, it's revealed that Cece has deposits of antibodies and complexes in the capsules of her kidneys. These regions of dense buildup tell a story that something has been happening with her immune system for some time now. 
Antibodies that would have been used to combat infections have infiltrated her kidneys. This accumulation means that maybe she's had a chronic or long-term infection that's been ongoing. Or that maybe she has autoimmune disease, meaning that her immune system has been wrongly activated to attack her own body's cells. If she's eaten cookie dough every week for a long time and salmonella from the uncooked eggs are in there, then maybe that could be her chronic infection? But that doesn't make sense, since that would mean that the bacteria would have spilled into her blood at some point in time. And that bacteremia, or bacterial presence in blood, would have been obvious. And without a history of lupus or arthritis or anything like that, it doesn't look like she has autoimmune disease, but we can't know for sure. But what we can know for sure is that CeCe's kidney function has worsened again. Over the next 24 hours, more than 10 grams of protein are collected from her urine, indicating severe kidney injury. Whatever the case is, it looks like her immune system is more active than it should be. The best way to resolve this inflammation is to give her corticosteroids, which are medicines that reduce the activity of the immune system. She started on a high daily dose of prednisone and sent home. But things only got worse. It's a week later, CC presents again to the emergency room, this time with fevers, chills, and hematuria. There is now a presence of blood in her urine. She's nauseous, vomiting, and has severe diarrhea. Salmonella enteritidis, the bacteria commonly found in uncooked eggs from cookie dough, was isolated from her urine and her blood cultures, as well as her stool, confirming this time an acute infection. High-dose corticosteroids immediately increases the risk of infection because of its action on the immune system. Her steroid dose is tapered, and she's started on antibiotics, and her fever quickly resolves. Her urine and blood cultures become sterile as her infection is then rapidly cleared. As she's discharged from the hospital, she's told to stop eating cookie dough. She's told to stop eating anything uncooked. She's given a four-week prescription for antibiotics to make absolutely sure that the infection is cleared. Explicit instructions were given to her to complete the entire course, even if she feels okay. And she feels great. Until two weeks pass. Cece can't stand on her own because of a sharp pain in her right leg. She starts scratching her back and it becomes painful as she realizes a giant rash has developed as her fever, nausea, and vomiting return. Back in the emergency room, again. The medical team looks at the rash closely. Plaques and scales were observed. Usually rashes come from an allergy because she's on new antibiotics. This might be an allergic reaction to them. But an antibiotic rash doesn't look like plaques and scales, meaning that this is probably something else. Which is confirmed because CC tells the medical team she never filled her prescription of antibiotics because she felt like she didn't need them. As CC is triaged in the emergency room, she needs to use the bathroom. Despite the searing, stabbing pain in her right leg, she didn't tell the medical team about it. She was too preoccupied with scratching her back for them to notice. As she gets up, she feels her right leg pulse. She hears a fiber snap as she suddenly collapses to the ground. The medical team suddenly rushes to her. Imaging finds multiple lesions in her fractured right tibia. CC didn't tell the medical team that several years ago she had broken her leg at this exact spot. Bone biopsy finds Salmonella enteritidis as the causative agent of this osteomyelitis. Osteo meaning bone, mylo referring to marrow, and itis meaning inflammation, or in this case, infection. A bone infection that was found again with a blood culture confirming Salmonella bacteremia meaning that within the time span of just a couple of weeks, the same exact bacteria from the eggs in her cookie dough is again infecting CC. The mysterious kidney failure, the severe infection after steroids, the rash, the recurring infection. The medical team realizes that this is a case of immunocompromise. There's only a couple situations where recurrent Salmonella enteritidis bacteremia could happen. The first is an organ transplant where medicines would have been given to suppress the immune activity to prevent the body from rejecting the donated organ. But CC never had an organ transplant, meaning that this could be a case of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, also known as AIDS. At this realization, the medical team immediately tests her for human immunodeficiency virus. Serologic testing returned positive. A viral load of 550,000 copies per milliliter of blood was found, and a measure of her CD4 T cells, which are the immune cells that are targeted by the virus, was 60 cells per milliliter of blood. Under 200 cells per milliliter is the criteria for AIDS as she's diagnosed with it for the first time at the age of 78. This finding is consistent with everything. 
HIV is known to cause kidney damage in late stage disease. This nephropathy is characterized by gross proteinuria with rapidly progressive kidney disease. The collapsing form of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis with interstitial inflammation is a classic presentation of HIV-associated nephropathy, but only obvious in retrospect. Rashes are common in HIV patients, and this rash was not characteristic of an antibiotic hypersensitivity. Very high-dose prednisone, like the one CC received, is not something that you want to give to an AIDS patient because the medicine increases the infection risk of a patient. And AIDS itself is a disease where the human immunodeficiency virus exhausts the immune system, leaving the host vulnerable to infections that just don't happen in people who haven't been infected with the virus. The cookie dough that CC ate every week were a source of Salmonella enteritidis. It put her at risk every time she ate it for lunch. And in immunocompetent people, the infection that you get from uncooked eggs or mishandled poultry is not common. It's definitely not recurrent, and it's most likely never in this kind of severity. CC tells the medical team that about 10 years ago she broke her right leg. It seemed to heal, but the doctor at the time noticed reactive sclerosis surrounding an irregular lesion. She never went back for follow-up after her leg healed because she never felt the need to. We can only speculate here, but it's likely that she already had HIV back then when she was 68. Which brings us to the final consideration of this case. Most notably, I can't think of any of my colleagues who'd get a history of activity with partners in an elderly woman. Obviously, it should be obtained no matter how awkward the situation, depending on the person. But HIV is just not the first thing that comes to mind in someone over 70 years old. Most common are going to be cancer, heart problems, diabetes. When she was asked, Cece didn't have much to say about that activity, except she was in a monogamous relationship for more than 40 years. That she did have a blood transfusion after an accident about 25 years ago in Latin America, which would bring us to the 1990s. If she had hemophilia, this could be a lead as to how she got the infection because well-documented violations of basic principles and ethics from Western institutions exist from that time, where HIV-contaminated products were knowingly shipped to the region. These products should have been destroyed, but instead they were repackaged and distributed and sold to these other countries to protect those institutions' investments. And then it knowingly infected the people who lived in those countries. But without evidence of hemophilia, which would indicate the use of these factors, it may not be likely. And while so much time has passed that we can't confirm absolutely that this is the reason for her infection, well, she has the virus. It's been replicating and depleting her immune system, but at least it's nice that we were able to catch it this time. With support from her family and the medical team, the initiation of triplet antiretroviral therapy, CC's viral load was undetectable after six months. Her rash resolved, her kidney function improving, her bones healing. CC was able to sustain a full recovery. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.